Card, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Diego Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 125 regarding a dead body at the Holmes Hotel. That's all. Modern police cars make ideal testing laboratories for gasoline. Every hour of the day and night, they travel over the same street that you drive on, meeting the same traffic congestion, stopping, starting, speeding up hundreds of times daily. And what gasoline do you suppose has proved most economical for police cars? You know, everybody knows, that more police cars are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. Of course, this gasoline was first chosen for police cars because of the unusual speed and power it developed. But the very refining process that makes Rio Grande crack the more powerful gasoline also makes it more economical. It is the exclusive, patented Rio Grande cracking process that breaks up the atoms so that every drop burns more thoroughly and creates more power than uncracked gasoline. Unless gasoline is cracked, whole drops pass through your cylinders without burning. They drift down to dilute your oil. They go to waste out your exhaust. That isn't economical. Your car, every car, needs a gasoline that burns quickly, efficiently, without waste. Rio Grande cracked gasoline has been proved by many cities and counties that keep accurate records to be the most efficient and most economical gasoline. If you want to get more for your money, if you want to enjoy police car performance in your own car, fill up your tank with the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline that police cars use. Now it is our pleasure to present Chief of Police George Sears of San Diego, California. Chief Sears. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When uh, you have spent most of your life in the policing business, you come to the realization that the unexpected is the thing to expect. And apparently simple crime may develop into an almost unsolvable mystery and a baffling, clueless murder may solve itself. It uh, is customary for calling all cars to dramatize the more spectacular crimes in which there was an immense amount of police work. But in uh, tonight's broadcast, you'll hear a case which literally dropped into our lap. Uh, nevertheless, I believe it will prove of interest to you, uh, for it attempts to go behind the impersonality of a police file and search the souls of the human beings involved. If you were to read the story in a book, you would say that the writer's imagination was getting away from him, and yet this is the way it happened, just as you will now hear, hear now. The beach at Waikiki. Warm living moonlight paints the breaking surf with silver. Catches the waving palm fronds on the white sand, throws deep shadows in the tropical jungle beyond. Through the heavy, lush foliage glimmers the light of a campfire, and across the sweet scented night comes the sound of native music. Swaying to the rhythm of the hula, three native girls circle the fire, their grass skirts swishing. The guests at the luau, stuffed with fish and coconuts, papayas and mangoes, watch with sleeping interest. Suddenly, one of them, an American sailor, nudges his companion. Hey, Henry, it's really 11 o'clock. we got to get going. Why? I'm having a good time. Yeah, but the last Liberty boat leaves at 11.30. What of it? Let us go. Now, oh, listen, Hank, you can't afford to report late again. I'm having too good a time to worry about Uncle Sam's Navy. They'll get along without me until morning. Yeah, but your chore leaves up at midnight. Yeah, hey, at midnight I'll just be starting Give me another swig of that old coolie. Oh, look, you've had enough, Hank. You better come with me now. Ah, oh, nuts, you make me stick with. Always spoiling the fun. I got a date. At uh, least I think I have. A date? Who is? That little Kanaka on the right. Hey, sister, come over here a minute. Come on. 
Come on, I won't eat you. What do you want? Huh? Listen, my partner here says I gotta go home at midnight. You're not going home at midnight, are you? Oh no. I don't know time. Maybe all night. Maybe you don't dance all the time. Maybe you take a walk with me. Maybe. Go on, scram back to the battle line. What's your name, Susan? Next morning, when seaman Henry Hoffman, CPI'd, steps on the deck of his boat, a master of arms orders him to the captain's quarters. The captain comes quickly to the point. Hoffman, you overstayed shore leave last night? Yes, sir. You see, I was held up. I missed the last Liberty boat. I don't want any more of your explanations. You've been drinking, Hoffman. Oh, no, sir. Don't lie to me. I can smell alcohol when you clear across this desk. Well, maybe I did have a few... <laughs> A few. But you know how it is, sir. Yes, I know how it is. Your record shows this offense repeatedly. Overstaying surely. Arrest for drunkenness by the shore patrol and so on. We don't want men like you in the Navy. But, sir... Your cruise is about up, isn't it, Hoffman? Yes, sir, in three months. I've had more than enough of you in my command. I'm transferring you to San Diego for the rest of your enlistment. To San Diego? Yes, and furthermore... I recommend that you be given a bad conduct this job. Oh, no, sir, please. That would mean I could never enlist again. Exactly. But, sir, the Navy's my whole life. I don't know anything else. I can't help that. You certainly haven't been a very valuable adjunct to the Navy. The Navy would be better off without you. But, sir, I'll try to do better. I promise. You'll sail on the pension tomorrow morning. That's all, Hoffman. <laughs> Seaman Hoffman goes home in disgrace, back to San Diego to serve out the rest of his enlistment, and then leave the Navy forever. Brooding upon what he considers the injustice of his case, he calls upon his commanding officer in San Diego. I'd like to speak to you, sir, regarding my record. Yes, Hoffman? Yes, you know about me, sir. I have looked over your record. Not very favorable, is it? I guess not, sir. But I haven't been on report since I got here from the islands. No, Hoffman, that's right. You haven't. Well, sir, I'm doing my best to reform. That's commendable, Hoffman. I don't know what was the matter with me over there. My record was good before, but I couldn't keep in line in Hawaii. Too much of a gooey hour, eh? Not only that, but the whole atmosphere of the place. The laziness of it, the beauty. Yeah, I know what you mean, Hoffman. There are some men who can't stand the tropics. Yes, sir. I guess I almost went native. I didn't want to do anything over there but guzzle oak and sit under a palm tree with one of those native girls. They are lovely, aren't they? Yes, sir. I never met any woman like them. Neither have I. <clears throat> that is it. Well, Hoffman, I think you made your position clear. Yes, sir. I hope so. And you feel now that you have returned to these, uh, saner shores, that you can behave yourself? I know I can, sir. Very well. I'll place you on probation for the rest of the term of your enlistment. Oh, thank you, sir. You don't know what this means to me. Very well, Hoffman. That will be all. Yes, sir. Hello there, Henry. Been in the old man's carpet again? Not me. I've been selling a bill of goods. What do you mean? I think I got it about set so I won't get a bad conduct. Yeah? Oh. The old man's going to put me on probation until my hitch is up. Make a willy boy out of you, huh? Well, it's worth it if I can ship over again. Why the devil do you want to join up again? I think one hitch in this man's navy would be enough for anybody. Not for me, Ed. I... Well, I love it. It's got meaning. When you're a gob, you're following tradition. John Paul Jones and Dewey and the rest. <laughs> you sound like a recruiting officer. Look at it this way, Ed. Where would you and me be if we weren't gobs? Jerking sodas or working in a garage somewhere. A fine life for a guy. And instead, 
you we aren't doing a man's job. Defenders of old glory. And the banker's investments overseas. Ed, don't say that. That sounds revolutionary. Revolutionary, my eye. I'm in the Navy because it's better than being on relief. And if you told the truth, that's why you're here. Oh, no. Oh, it's more than that. Look out there at that line of battle wagons with the smoke pouring out of the stacks and the sun sinking behind them. Boy, that's beauty. If I was an artist, I'd like to paint that. Oh, uh, yeah. And then at night when the searchlights are signaling, the harbor looks like a bunch of giant lightning bugs had landed on it. it it's thrilling, Ed. Ah, uh, nuts. You need a drink. Come on, let's go ashore. Not me, Ed. I'm on probation. I ain't gonna touch a drop. I got too much at stake. Too much at stake? Fifty-four bucks a month and a kick in the pants. So long, sap. Regardless of the cynical observations of his messmate, Seaman Hoffman, the idealist, rigidly observes the term of his probation. After two months have passed, he prepares a letter to the naval authorities in Washington asking permission to re-enlist. When it is completed, he takes it to the commanding officer, who promises to forward it to the proper authorities in Washington. Several days go by, and Hoffman hears nothing of his request. Finally, he determines to ask his commanding officer about it. Well, Hoffman, beg pardon, sir, but have you received any news from Washington about me? There's hardly time, Hoffman. After all, the Navy Department has other things to consider besides your application. Yes, sir, I realize that, but I hope maybe you had some news for me. I'll let you know when I have. Yes, sir, but could you tell me, sir, have you any idea? Yes, I have an idea. I have an idea it will be bad news. Bad news? Yes. The board over at the training station read your application and forwarded it to Washington. But with it, they sent a recommendation that you be refused permission to re-enlist. But, sir, my probation, I've proven that I'm a good sailor. Apparently, the officers do not feel that two months of exemplary behavior can overcome a year of bad conduct. I'm afraid there's not much chance for you, Hoffman. If you ask me, that's a fine way to treat a guy. I didn't ask you, Hoffman. That will be all. Yes, sir. Dazed by the collapse of his boats, Hoffman breaks probation, goes ashore with his messmate Ed, seeks to forget his troubles in the bar whiskey of a waterfront saloon. It's kicking a man when he's down, that's what it is. Ah, forget it, Hank. Yeah, have another drink. Yeah, that's what I need. Another drink, and another, and another... And tomorrow, what then? A hangover. And start all over again. What's the use, Ed? What's the use? The joy of living and all that junk you've been talking about. The glory of Uncle Sam's name. Yeah, I was on a bum course with that stuff, I can tell you. Ed, didn't you ever think, what's the use? Didn't you ever wonder why you was living and why you should go on living? Huh? Hey, what are you talking about? I mean, what's the use of living? You sound like a schoolboy in love. Hey, you ain't thinking of bumping yourself off, are you? I'm not sure, Ed. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. The world will still go around without you in it. And the U.S. Navy will still get along without you in it. That's just it, Ed. You're right. Here I am. Trouble with you, Hank. You take life too seriously. Yeah, yeah. You're right again, Ed. Pour me another drink, will you? Sure, sure. Hey, so what are you putting in that drink? Just some medicine. Medicine for what? What ailed me? I didn't know you were sick. Sure I am, Ed. Plenty sick. Well, here's to the mess called life. 
I can't do it, Ed. I can't do it. Hey, what are you talking about? What's the idea of dropping your glass? I can't do it. I can't. Hey, where are you going? Gotta get out of here, Ed. I'll see you later. One of all the crazy gobs I even hey, knew. Hey, sailor, nobody dropped this bottle this way out. Yeah, yeah thanks. What? I boy, the mercury tablets. What's the matter with that guy? He looks goofy to me. Yeah, he is. Yeah, the poor mug. Didn't even have the nerve to bump himself off. <laughs> Nice out here in the park on a hot night, isn't it? Yeah. What's the trouble? You look down in the dumps. I am. Mean, yeah. Mind if I sit down for a while? I feel total low, too. What's the matter with you? Oh, nothing much. Just do. Got no family, no job. You're lucky. What do you mean? Well, you haven't got any job to lose. <laughs> Funny way to look at it. Yeah, ain't it? If you haven't got anything to live for, why don't you commit suicide? I... I thought of that. Uh, I haven't got the nerve. Do you want to die? There ain't much use to live in these days, is there? No. Of course, you wouldn't know about that. Being in the Navy and getting your three square a day and all. Yeah, I got to sink. Sure you have. That's what you think. Work like a slave, obey all the rules. Guys in the gold braid make up and get it in the neck. That's a navy for you. Some people are worse off. Sure they are. A lot of people are better off. Where does that get you? Mm. I need a drink. I know a good speakeasy. I, I don't want to go where there's a lot of people. Well, how about you and me getting a room down at the Holmes Hotel and a bottle of liquor? That's more like it. Then we can get good and drunk. Swine drunk. Come on. <laughs> San Diego Detective Bureau. Pickman speaking. Yes? Yes? We'll be right down. Come on, you. What's up? Murder at the Holmes Hotel. Right in here, officer. Hmm. Nice looking man. That's just as I found him. I haven't touched a thing. Hmm. Choked to death with that belt. And the wrist flashed through that broken whiskey bottle. The body is still warm, Ed. Uh, loosen the belt around his neck. Maybe still alive. Mm. There. No, I'm afraid not. Heart stopped. Who is this man? I don't know. He registered here last night with a sailor. A sailor? What name does he give? Well, on the register it says Clark Gable and brother. Phony. Did you see the sailor leave the room? Yes, he left a few minutes ago. I wondered about the other one, so I knocked on the door a couple of times. Didn't get any answer. So finally, I let myself into the pesky. And uh, this is what I found. Were you on the desk when they registered last night? No. Who was? Bob Reynolds, my night clerk. Where is he now? Asleep. Wake him up. I want to talk to him. Uh, it'll be a hard job. He just went to sleep. I don't care about that. Wake him up. Yes, sir. And a couple of blocks away at the same time, a drunken sailor staggers into a little dry goods shop. Good morning, young man. Can I show you something? I don't want to buy anything. I want you to do me a favor. Yes? I just choked the man to death. Oh. I want you to call the police and tell them to come get me. Oh, you've been drinking, haven't you, my boy? What's that to you? And you're imagining things. Why, a nice young lad like you wouldn't choke anyone. Now, now, why don't you go home and get some rest? You look as though you need to... I get... tell you, I just murdered a guy. Call the police for me, will you? Now, now, you're getting all upset. Please, take an old lady's advice and get some rest. Ah, nuts. Hey, uh, look, Ed. addition to this belt around his neck is a folded towel. Yeah, and here's a filler slip with some broken bits of bottle. Identical with the bloody pieces of glass. We better look the corpse over for identification. Right. Hey, here's Bob, officer. Oh, yes. Sorry to wake you up, but you see what we're up against. Gee, 
Now, I want you to tell me all you know about the two men who rented this room. Well, they, they came in about 1 a.m., this, this fellow, and the sailor, this fellow registered, and the sailor paid for the room. Did you question them about the phony names? Why should I? So long as they pay for the room, I don't care what names they give. I see. Well, what happened after that? Well, I left the call at 6 o'clock and went up to the room. Did you waken them at 6 o'clock? Yeah, I knocked on the door and there was no answer, so I went in and waked them. I, I left the light on and went out again. It was pretty drunk when I went in. I see. Did you notice the sailor leaving? No, I woke up the boss and then turned in. How about you? Did you see the sailor leave? Yes, I told you. I saw him leave about half an hour ago. And he can't be very far away. There's a key from the Gold Coast Hotel in this fellow's pocket, Ed. The only thing I can find. Good. You better go over there and see if they can identify him. I'll call the coroner and have headquarters check on the Navy landing stages. This guy hasn't gone very far yet. Big boy. Hello, Edna. What's the trouble with you? You look like the tail end of a bad night. Yeah. Will it be a cup of java? No. Edna, I, I want to borrow a nickel. You want to borrow a nickel? What for? I want to telephone the police. I just murdered a man. Say, what are you trying to do? Kid somebody? Won't anyone take me serious? I just murdered a man, I said. Choked him to death. Pull a bell around his throat, cut his wrist with a broken bottle, killed him, do you understand? Murdered him! Hey, what's all the noise out here, Edna? Big hit boy here has been kicking the gong around, boss. Trying to tell me he just bumped a guy or... What? Listen, Edna, will you lend me a nickel? That's all I ask. Well, okay, sure, here it is. Thanks. Think I'm kidding, do you? Hello. Give me the police department, will you? Hey, what is this? The guy must be crazy or something. You really suppose he killed somebody? That's what he said, and he sure looks good. Hello, police station. Listen, I just killed a guy. Yeah, come and get me. I'm waiting for you down at Blackie's night spot on B Street. <laughs> Officer Connors is dispatched to the restaurant and arrests Hoffman. Detective Dickman, notified of the sudden turn in his murder mystery, rushes to headquarters to escort the sailor back to the scene of the crime. Completely composed, Hoffman is led into the room where the battered corpse lies. Bob, is this the sailor who came in with the deceased last night? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Whose body is that, Hoffman? I don't know. I never saw him before last night. Did you register at this hotel with him last night? You just heard the clerk say so, didn't you? Did you kill him? Yes, I killed him. I'm sorry I did, though. Poor guy. Why'd you kill him? You have to have a motive. I just killed him, that's all. You must have had a reason. Maybe I did. But that's neither here nor there. The poor guy's dead, and I killed him. So I'll hang for it. Probably. If you won't tell me why you did it, perhaps you'll tell me how you did it. Sure. We checked in here last night and got plenty drunk. But I wasn't drunk when I woke up this morning. I was pretty sober. I looked at him sleeping there on the bed. Then I took the belt out of his trousers and got it around his neck and was choking him before he woke up. He struggled, but I didn't let go. I pulled tighter and tighter. Then he didn't struggle anymore. He just fell onto the floor. How did his wrist get cut? I slashed him with a broken liquor bottle. I broke the bottle and the pillow slip, and then I cut his wrist. He didn't bleed much, though. But why did you do it? That's my business. I've confessed. What else do you want? Who is this fellow? I haven't the slightest idea. I met him out in the park last night. He didn't tell me his name. It's tough for him, but he's better off, I guess. He said he didn't have much to live for. Maybe I did him a favor, huh? Detective Roper's investigation of the identity of the slain man stops at his hotel, where the management informs the officer that his name is J.P. McDonald, Jr., but no further clues to his identity or the whereabouts of his family are found in his room. Still puzzled by the attitude of Hoffman, Detective Dickman determines to find the motive for the crime. That evening, after the murder has been booked, and his confession taken and signed, Dickman brings him to his office, questions him for hours, 
meet with stubborn refusal from the taciturn sailor. But finally, long after midnight, the shrewd officer breaks down the psychological barrier. Hoffman begins to talk, tells Dickman about his troubles in the Navy, about his probation, about the refusal of the San Diego authorities to recommend him for re-enlistment. I felt pretty low. I was being kicked when I was down. I'd lived up to my end of a bargain. But the commander hadn't made a bargain with you. No, but I felt certain he understood me. Let's put it this way. I believed in the Navy. I didn't think the Navy let me down, do you see? I think I do. Well, when I got the bad news yesterday, I figured what's the use. I went ashore and got a little drunk, and I decided I wasn't any good to anybody, so I might as well bump myself off. I bought some bichloride tablets at a drugstore, and I put some in a shot of liquor. But I didn't have the guts to drink it. It made me hate myself all the more. Then I met this guy I murdered, and we went to the hotel and got drunk. And this morning when I woke up and sat looking at him sleeping, I saw the way out for me. It was all very simple, see? I killed him and gave myself up. Now I'll hang for it, and my troubles will be over. You mean you want to hang? Yes, of course. I didn't have the nerve to kill myself, so this way the state will do it for me. Well, did you have any feelings for the poor fellow you murdered? Oh, he felt pretty low, too. Said he was out of a job. He won't be missed. The world will be a better place all around with both of us out of the way. <laughs> When Hoffman goes on trial, he is without counsel, and the court assigns a public defender to plead his case for him. Roland DeFere, defense attorney, enters a plea of not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. But an alienist finds Hoffman sane, and Hoffman makes no effort to fight the charge against him. Willingly, he takes the stand and testifies in detail regarding the murder. At no time during the trial is it necessary for the district attorney, Thomas Whelan, to prove guilt. The defendant is only too willing to admit it. Finally, after the prosecution has demanded Hoffman's life for the state, the day comes when the sailor faces the bar of justice. Henry Hoffman, stand and face the court. Before I pass judgment upon you, you uh, anything to say? Yes. Just this, Judge. Hang me. That's all I ask. Please hang me. Henry Hoffman... This court finds you guilty of murder in the second degree, hereby sentences you to the state prison of San Quentin for all the terms prescribed by the law. Terms prescribed by the law. What's that mean, Mr. DeFear? No, from five years to life, prison board will fix the term after you serve the year. Then they aren't going to hang me? Doesn't look like it. You're lucky, my boy. Lucky? You call it Lucky. No, 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 Judge. I, I don't I don't want to live. I want to die. Please hang me, Judge. I'm guilty. Guilty as hell. Get it over for me for the love Take of him God. Out there, I want to die. I want to get it case, over. I don't want to live. California versus Jose Gonzalez. Judge The man who wanted to hang lost, and is today serving out his term in San Quentin Penitentiary. We never found out more about his unfortunate victim than his name, J.P. McDonald, Jr. If there's anyone within the sound of my voice who may have information regarding the relatives or friends of J.P. McDonald, Jr., I'd appreciate it if you'd inform the San Diego Police Department. Thank you, Chief Sears. Ladies and gentlemen, look. An illustrated story of the strange case you have just heard is printed in the latest issue of the Calling All Cars News. Ask any dealer wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold for your free copy of this unusual publication and read more about tonight's Sailor Murder and other strange cases broadcast on this program. Illustrated in this free publication are 15 different free gifts for boys and girls, guns, microscopes, magic police pictures, complete junior detective and G-man outfits, 
In the past 30 days, Rio Grande dealers have almost doubled their sales of Sinclair motor oil. Motorists have discovered that this concentrated, purified oil has exclusive advantages found in no other oil. Thousands of motorists have switched in just the past month to Sinclair motor oil and find their motors run more quietly, accelerate faster, and develop greater speed and power than ever before. That's because all the wax and jelly is extracted from Sinclair motor oil, so there's no drag to cut down power and speed. Because Sinclair motor oils are so pure, so concentrated, so free from filler, they flow smoothly in intense cold and never break down, even at top speeds when so many motor oils fail to give protection. Ask your Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealer about Sinclair motor oil, and you'll discover why so many motorists are changing to the finest motor oils made. This is Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.